Welcome, my name is Dr. Lori Ernstberger, and today we're going to be talking about girls and women under the umbrella of ASD. I want to first begin by saying that I'm very proud to be also an author of a book called Girls Under the Umbrella of ASD, written with my co-author Danielle Wendell. Um, I'll talk more about Danielle and her daughter, uh, but I first want to talk about the cover of the book because when we first wrote a book on girls, we wanted to make sure to empower girls and include a girl's voice and women on the spectrum, include their voice from the very beginning. And so we interviewed many families across the United States about issues around girls and women. And we met a family um, and a young woman on the spectrum by the name of Amanda Lemunyan. And her mother told us that Amanda wanted to paint a picture for Danielle and I based on the title of our book, Girls Under the Umbrella. And so we said, sure, that'd be great, paint us a picture, and you never know what you're going to get. And the next day we got this amazing email with this picture attachment. And if you can make out, there is Amanda Lemony, and this is some years ago when we first were writing the book. And Amanda was an amazing artist. She's still an amazing artist. And when we saw that picture, we knew that it had to be the cover of the book so that we could show the strengths of girls and women on the spectrum. Amanda diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome over 10 years ago, um, but has many strengths and many talents. And so here is her picture. And we start our book right from the beginning saying that girls have a lot of strengths and self-determination, which we're going to talk about today. A little bit about myself, I am an autism consultant. Um, I have the privilege of traveling and talking to parents and teachers all over the world from Ireland to Australia and all over the United States and Canada. And I've been talking about girls and women on the spectrum in order to really bring a voice, awareness and education to parents and professionals on this topic. I'm going to cover today just a few topics, but if you have any follow-up questions, I always like to give my email address at drlori at cox.net. You can also look up um, more information about the professional development that I provide. I've been working with schools starting as a classroom teacher for 29 years, and so I appreciate any of your uh, contact, if your information with regard to questions or if you want contact information. Uh, about me would be uh, would be great. I have my PhD in special education. I'm also a board certified behavior analyst. And so today, this our our session is going to focus on three main areas: social communication skills, puberty and touchy subjects, and self determination. But before I begin, I want to uh, introduce my co-author Danielle Wendell and her daughter Madison Wendell. And really, that was the reason why we started. Uh, investigating, researching, and writing about girls and women on the spectrum was because of Madison, who is now a talented young woman. I'll talk more about her as we go along, um, and her experiences of being a girl on the spectrum as well. So there's Danielle and Madison. So our first area that we want to focus on, um, and this is also part two, if you did not have an opportunity in part one, we talked about the, the gender disparity, uh, the ratio between males and females. Now we're going to pick up and we're going to focus specifically on if a child, if a girl or a woman on the spectrum does have that diagnosis and an IEP team has determined an educational eligibility, what can we be doing? What can we be doing in terms of interventions and what can we be doing at home in terms of preparing our girls and women for a quality of life? And one of those areas, of course, is that area of social communication skills. We know that uh, for, as we talked about in part one, uh, girls are going to exhibit different behaviors than boys. That's not surprising. Here's a great quote from Tony Atwood. Many of you are probably familiar with Tony's work on Asperger's syndrome. There's his website if you want to follow up for more information. 
but he talks about that girls um, are very isolated and girls demonstrate our mask behaviors that when they get home they have a meltdown they don't have the skills for stress management or coping skills and so we need to look at those specific social communication deficit areas and intervene provide evidence-based interventions for our girls and women on the spectrum. There are some that, um, like Dr. Judith Gould, who talk about social skills for girls may look like the girl is more of a tomboy. They may not have those girly type behaviors just to, to in general. How do we teach that kind of friendship skills to girls on the spectrum? Well, first of all, we know that girls are gonna be different than boys. This great study that came out this last year from Head, McGilvery, and Stokes on females, they looked at a, at a friendship questionnaire and what for both males and females. And what we know is girls' friendship skills, and for any of you females out there, you know that girls' friendship skills are going to look different than boys. But what's happened over the years, we've had some success on social communication training. Maybe you've seen some webinars from Jed Baker. Certainly, Michelle Garcia Winner. We've seen uh, social skills books from Brenda Smith Miles, uh, a variety of social skills books navigating the social world. But all of those books on social skills training and individuals on the spectrum treat social skills as gender neutral, as if boys and girls are the same. And what this study reminds us is that girls socialize different. And we cannot just teach a cookie cutter social communication curriculum to males and females in the same way. We have to identify the social skills that are gonna have the greatest impact. What we know for any social skills training, and, and there's been quite a bit of research, in order for those skills to generalize, meaning in order for those skills to be used in the natural environment where that child is playing and learning and, and working, that we have to teach the skills that are gonna be the highest priority in that setting for that gender. And so it's important that as a teacher, when you're thinking about this, you may only have one or two girls um, in your classroom. Those social skills for the girls are going to be different than your social skills for boys in order for us to teach those high priority social skills. And so this study uh, reminds us to prioritize social skills that are gender based on females, not based on males. And so what are those social skills? What are social skills for girls that are gonna be different from boys? I, I love this picture of Madison. This is one thing I, I, all the parents that are watching and professionals, we need to encourage our girls to get involved at whatever level they can in any extracurricular activities and any areas where uh, they are showing strengths and, and interests early on. And so here's this great picture of Madison and, and she wanted to be a cheerleader and so, that sounds like a reasonable demand for a little girl, and, and, but Danielle said she really struggled with cheerleading because there's so many rules to follow and so much socialization, and so here's this great picture of Madison, but she's kind of looking the other way and has her fingers in her mouth. And, but in order to learn social skills, you have to hang around other girls. And when we have the gender disparity of males to females, we tend to have classrooms that have 10 males and one female. How are those girls um, like Madison, how are they going to learn social skills if they never have an opportunity to be around other girls? So it may be that professionals, my school people, my school personnel out there, as well as parents, we need to look for opportunities that are girl oriented. We need to create peer groups that are girl oriented and not just um, gender neutral, both males and females, if we want to teach those age appropriate social skills. And so that, that is a reason why Danielle took a very active approach when Madison was early on. She may not have been able to do all the cheers, but she was able to then be and socialize and practice new skills in a setting with other females. Now, I mentioned 
um, social skills curriculum. You can actually buy books on how to teach social skills and they will list for you goals and objectives on social skills. And I encourage teachers, that's a great place to start. You know, we need a framework or a manual of how to teach social skills. Um, and so you can find books, as, as I've mentioned, a few, and authors like Jed Baker who write those kinds of books. But those books are written specifically um, for both males and females. They create uh, gender neutral opportunities. And I want you to think about how can I take that curriculum or those lesson plans and now make sure that they have a female orientation. And so Brenda Smith Miles, many of you are familiar with her work. She's written quite a few books on, on um, individuals with ASD and teaching uh, children on the spectrum. Um, but she's written a book called The Hidden Curriculum. And I love this picture. Here's Madison several years ago with a good friend of hers. But I love it because these girls are just a few months apart. But for all of you who are working in those middle years, you know that the growth development can often be very different for kids at that age between uh, this is that 10 to 14 year of age. But when we look at social skills, you know, what will, uh, let's say Madison, I, she's probably 11 in this picture. What social skills does an 11 year old need? And this is where we need to examine other 11 year olds. What do other 11 year olds doing? How 11 year old girls, right? Um, how are other 11 year old girls interacting? And often those are the hidden areas. One of the areas um, that Madison needed um, that was in the hidden curriculum was how to write a note in class. Meaning, you know how you pass notes in class? Anybody remember doing that? We've all done that note passing. Well, Madison didn't know how to write a note in class. She didn't know all the little hidden steps to writing a note, that you have to be secretive, that you have to be quiet. You can't call out the other girl's name, right? Hey, Teresa, here's my note, and throw it across the classroom. But think about the skill of note passing. If all the other 11-year-old girls are writing notes, what do we want Madison to be doing? We want her to be able to write her own notes and pass them in class and do it appropriately to fit in in that natural environment. And so uh, the idea is teachers, parents, you might be teaching your students how to pass notes in class in order for them to socialize appropriately with their typical peers. That's a high priority. Now, five-year-old girls, they're probably not passing notes in class. But by 11, that's an important skill. So I want you to be thinking, you know, what are the skills that this girl needs at that age? Um, those socialization skills that are going to be important to them do not treat social skills as gender neutral. Now, the, there are many different interventions that we might be able to use. We have just a few preliminary findings on social skills and as far as intervention or evidence-based practices. Uh, I've listed some for you. Video modeling has been very effective for kids on the spectrum. If you're not using video modeling, there's a, there's an, a company called Model Me Kids. And I want to put a plug into any of those social skills video groups, video modeling groups out there. Uh, create video modeling of girls only so that we can have specific gender specific video modeling. I, I wish that was available right now. Right now um, the social skills and video modeling tends to be both males and females. But you can create your own. You know, in the day and age of an iPhone with a video camera, um, we can have other girls exhibiting appropriate behaviors like passing notes in class. I'm going to videotape the process of all the steps of how to pass a note. What do you write down? How do you fold it up? How do I wait for the teacher not to be looking? And I'm going to create a video of maybe another girl demonstrating, so a peer tutor demonstrating that behavior. And I'm going to use that video to teach kids, teach girls, uh, like Madison, how to pass a note in class. So video modeling is an effective practice. Um, there has been uh, numerous peer-reviewed research to support the use of video modeling. Now what we're lacking though is research specific to girls. 
we haven't uh, we haven't separated male interventions versus female interventions on the spectrum. But we can assume that video modeling would also be an effective practice uh, for teaching important skills like note passing. But other areas, um, other interventions for teaching uh, social skills to girls on the spectrum, clear and concise instructions. You know, one of the areas of social skills that's so important for girls is to give a compliment. Girls tend to, and women, as a matter of fact, just today I met somebody new and one of the things they said to me was, I like your shirt. That is how women communicate. I may not know you well, I may not ask you about your resume, I may not ask you about uh, other, th other areas, but one safe area to introduce yourself in that, in, in that way to initiate is to give a compliment. And that is a safe way that we can teach girls to say something nice, to say, you know, I like your shirt. Now, this is different than boys. Boys don't initiate conversations with, I like your shirt. Now, that's not always true. Some boys might, but they might talk about, I like your shoes, right? Or I like the way, mostly it's on physical acts, right? I, wow, I liked how you kicked that ball, right? Or you made an amazing, amazing skateboarding act this morning or did something on the skateboard. Um, so boys tend to compliment on specific actions, but girls tend to compliment. So when we talk about as girls get older, um, we're going to give them direct instruction on how to give a compliment. And maybe we're going to do some role playing on how to give a compliment. And we're going to script for them how to give a compliment. Or we're going to use a social story. So that's one of our interventions here, one of our methods. We're going to write a social story on how to give a compliment. Um, many of you are familiar with Carol Gray. Carol Gray was the first developer of social stories. It's also referred to as social narratives. Social narratives is the generic term for social stories, which is a trademark uh, uh, intervention. But a social story is a quick script of when I'm in the hallway at school, I'm going to see other girls. And you might identify who might you see today. What can I say to them as an introduction? Of course, girls might say, hey, what did you do last night? But more importantly, girls are going to say, wow, is that a new necklace? Or that's a cool, I love your nail polish. So I want you to be thinking, parents and professionals, about using those social stories for specific gender-related, uh, age-appropriate social skills, like how to give a compliment. That is a lifelong skill that we can teach any of our girls. Um, uh, starting at an early age and using up through adulthood. So just a few rules in terms of, of gender and social skills. We want to make sure we pick uh, social skills that are going to be used immediately in that natural environment. So what are other 16-year-old girls doing? What are other 5-year-old girls doing? You know, when girls are younger, they tend to touch a lot more. 5-year-olds, girls hugging, they touch each other when they sit, they like to sit closer together. You know, are we teaching our girls to accept that kind of proximity? Are we modeling that behavior for them? Are we practicing with them? And then are we giving them feedback? Yeah, you did great, you know, as far as what types of skills are they exhibiting? And so we want to make sure that we're giving them that reinforcement and, and specific concrete feedback on what they did well. Now, I'm mentioning over here uh, on this slide as well, uh, Ami Klin. He is a professor very well known for his research in ASD at Emory University. And he believes, and I think most of us would say, that girls might learn in a different way than boys. But right now, the, we don't have the research to support that specific evidence-based practices are better for males versus females. We do know that maybe girls are better at reading some social cues. Girls are better at mimicking others. So maybe drama and role play might be the appropriate method for girls on the spectrum. So you want to use your data to, to uh, determine, am I using the right methods? And so I might start by using social stories. I might start by using role play with feedback and uh, video modeling. And I'm going to take some data to see, are my interventions actually uh, showing uh, measurable outcomes? And then I'm going to tweak my program based on those outcomes for the student.
So maybe we're going to use more visuals for girls um, on the spectrum and more social interventions with them as well. Now, um, you can't talk about girls and socializing without talking about bullying. And I just want to quickly say that uh, this is where it's much more challenging for adults to see and observe um, the kinds of bullying that occurs with girls. I don't want to over exaggerate some anecdotal um, uh, evidence, which just is my my subjective uh, observations and discussions with parents and women on the spectrum, but I don't think I've met a girl or a woman on the spectrum who hasn't told me about some pretty horrific social uh, isolation, exclusion, and bullying done by girls. And I, if you have not heard of the Mean Stinks campaign, it's done through uh, Dove Soap and, and some other manufacturers. And it's just really a great girls campaign on how to be nice to other girls. And so I think it's important. It's just something that maybe your school, um, uh, if you have a club in your school, maybe student council, maybe there's other uh, groups that are more predominantly girls, maybe cheerleading. Maybe the cheerleaders can take on the Mean Stinks campaign and you paint your blue pinky, uh, you paint your pinky blue and you do the pinky swear and it's all great girl stuff and it's, it's really the messages uh, for kindness. And so I'm going to do another seminar on bullying. So look for more information on that topic. But specifically with girls, we're talking about relational bullying. And just because you can't see it, that doesn't mean it doesn't have the long-term harm and trauma um, that physical bullying has and more verbal bullying that's uh, more observable for adults. So check out the Mean Stinks. They have activities that you can be doing in school. And it also might be an opportunity to create. Remember, we, we're going to have to create some peer mentoring, but not just any peers, girls. So maybe I can put together a Mean Stinks campaign in my elementary school, middle school, or high school, um, make it age appropriate, and that might be a great socialization group to include our girls um, on the spectrum, our girls with disabilities, and create a really kindness campaign um, for, that, for that group as well. So check out Mean Stinks. Moving on to part two. So we've talked about socialization, and really the take-home message there is don't treat social skills and social skills curriculum as gender neutral. Social skills not only has to be age appropriate, it's got to be gender appropriate. So we want to teach our girls um, the most high priority social skills that they're going to use immediately in their environment. And we might have to create opportunities for them um, to use, utilize those skills if, the, if our girls are not in included settings. Um, we're going to create those peer groups made of females, though, right? So part two as we look at um, some strategies for growing up on the spectrum as a woman or as a girl on the spectrum. And we're going to get into touchy subjects, which we can't avoid them um, if we're going to talk about girls and women on the spectrum. So let's talk a little bit about puberty and touchy subjects and how can we gear our interventions again um, for um, supporting the unique needs of girls on the spectrum. Now one of the women on the spectrum that I have come to admire and I watch her on YouTube and I've read her book um, is Rudy Simone. And here is her book called Ask for Girls. Again, she has a series of YouTube videos. You can just look up Rudy Simone and listen to her talk and, and she'll provide insight. She is a woman on the spectrum, but she is also an incredible voice in terms of how to empower your child on the spectrum. Some of us live in very rural areas and maybe as a parent, um, you haven't had an opportunity to connect with other parents who have girls on the spectrum. You know, this is a way to learn more about how to help your daughter. Um, so her book on Asperger girls discusses social skills, talks about puberty, a whole range of issues that Rudy has um, come to be really an expert about. So I encourage you to read more about her work on Asperger girls. Um, but we really want to talk about, again, the, the difference between males and females comes uh, to light and is even more pronounced when we talk about appearance. And I love this quote by Zosha Zaks. Um, what, what the quote is discussing is that males can get away with being messy, 
you know, it's perfectly fine for that guy to, boy, to wake up in the morning and hair a little out of place and maybe wore that t-shirt from yesterday and, and just really the, the, the expectations for boy appearance versus girl appearance is different. Now we could argue it's not fair. We could argue that, oh, we shouldn't, it shouldn't be that way. We should, and I'm not talking about judging. I'm just saying some general guidelines for appearance. And if we want our girls to be able to socialize and to be able to be included and to have that quality of life where they have a job or working at some independent um, level, that they have social relationships that are meaningful to them and that they live as independently as, as they can, then we have to really look at appearance. There has to be some standards of appearance. And if that standard is different males versus females, that's for that you know, the parents and the, and the school team to think about. But boys can get away with being what uh, Zosha says. Boys can get away with um, looking disorderly. But for girls, you're going to be judged on a different standard. And so we need to make sure we identify clear and concrete standards for our girls. Uh, here's a young woman that I've had the opportunity to meet from my uh, days when I was writing my book on girls with Danielle. And she was more that tomboy. Uh, Judith Gould from um, the UK, uh, the Autistic Society from the UK, talks about, you know, do girls uh, demonstrate more tomboy-like? Do they lack interest of, of girly activities just in general? That is not true. I've met women on the spectrum, Rudy Simone, who would say, no, she's very much interested in makeup or fashion or whatever stereotype for girls would be. I think we do have to set, though, some basic hygiene requirements for success. It doesn't mean that you have to be, we have to meet every standard in, in terms of what our culture might say is a woman's standard versus males. But we don't want to set our girls up for failure, you know, that we don't want to say, oh, it's okay if you never brush your hair or, or uh, brush your teeth, right? Basic hygiene requirements have to be put in place for a quality of life. Now, I have come across the, this series of books for my own daughter. She's now 22, but I encourage parents and all my school personnel watching that you get both books, The Care and Keeping of You. These books are not, um, they are safe to read for young children. I think the recommenda recommenda recommendation is to begin around age eight. But this is just about how to have your basic health and hygiene requirements. This is not sex education. We're going to get to that topic. This is, you know, brushing my hair and changing my shirt and putting on deodorant and, and some of the basic health requirements. There's two books. I cannot say enough about them. They are from the American Girls series, and they are not um, written specifically to children with disabilities or to girls and women on the spectrum. But the way they are written, whoever wrote those books, they wrote for um, very simplistic language, and there's lots of visuals to explain what we're talking about when we talk about health and hygiene. Can't say enough about those books. Um, I remember when Danielle first got one of the books, book one for Madison, they read it every night, the same parts over and over again. For example, shaving your legs, you know, when do I start shaving my legs and should I shave my legs? And, and so what are the requirements? Madison would read that chapter over and over again so that she could learn more about the care and keeping of herself. Other grooming areas, create a checklist. Um, for some, you know, for some girls, we're going to have to break that checklist down and do the task analysis. What does it mean to brush your hair? That's pretty, that, that's kind of a general. Where do I start? How many times do I brush each side? And what about the back of my hair? You know, for, for some girls on the spectrum, um, if I don't see it, it's not happening back here. And so I need to remind our girls, okay, so it's how many times on this side, how many times on the other side, and also looking in a mirror. Is anything sticking up, right? Is everything where it's supposed to be? And so we're going to do a task analysis, which we do for any functional skill or a functional performance, and we're going to write it down in very clear language. How do I get ready in the morning? What are the steps? Your language is going to be important. So clear, concrete, um, 
you might want to use some visuals for each step. So you're going to create a little checklist. It might look something like this. Now, if you have a child who's not reading, I'm going to use pictures that you can get off the internet, Google Images, or many schools have uh, different board maker for your visual supports. So my, for my school personnel, uh, I want you to be thinking about creating this checklist and sending it home to mom and dad. Um, at, if you're at home, if you have access to a computer, um, you can easily print this off. And so your daughter in the morning, she has that list or in the evening. It's important that our girls learn early that it's their personal hygiene. And that needs to be practiced repeatedly with success, with performance feedback starting early. And if you still have a teenage daughter where you're having to go into the bathroom and remind them of each step, all right, did you brush your teeth for two minutes? Did you put on deodorant? We're not teaching those independent skills. So put together a checklist. Maybe just start with a couple of these. I'm not saying we're going to have 25 things to do in the bathroom. Maybe I'm just going to start with two things to do in the bathroom. And when they have learned those skills to mastery and they have successfully achieved each one of those, then I'm going to add another skill on there. But this is something school personnel, please work closely with your families so that they have an easy to use checklist. I would even suggest laminating this so that it can just be reused with dry erase. And at the end of the day, parents and the, and the daughter can go over the checklist and then success, look in the mirror, um, or in the morning, you're good to go out the door. And so be very specific, clear and concrete, start small, do the task analysis, role play, um, provide that performance feedback. Now, let's go back to what we talked about with video modeling. We might be able to use video modeling for some of these. Um, I, I would be cautious about taking any pictures that are not appropriate in the shower. No, of course. Um, or maybe toileting anything around personal areas in the toilet. But I could certainly do how to put on deodorant, brush teeth for two minutes, look in the mirror. So don't, uh, you know, you might, you might use interventions that we talked about for social skills for some of this functional performance at well, as well. Remember, video modeling uh, has a lot of research to support its effectiveness. So I found this website, How to Find a Bra. Now, now you might think, well, that's easy. You go find a bra, you put it on. But there's lots of steps to it. I did not even realize I, I needed to learn more about this. So Kids Health, great organization, lots of safe information. You and your child could sit down, your daughter could sit down at school. Um, this would be a site that I think even schools um, might allow through. I know some of the filters out there can be. Uh, difficult, but check out Kids Health, see if your site at school will let that through. I don't think there's anything on there, but it's all about straps, snaps, bands, and cups. We want to teach. We're teachers, and I know some of these topics are touchy subjects or sensitive topics, but we must address them as we are with providing direct information and then also making sure that parents are following up with that discussion. So kidshealth.org. When we get into touchy subjects of personal hygiene, we've got to start discussing on uh, puberty and menstruation. And so we want to be able to have our girls uh, prepared for um, uh, when they're going to menstruate and to be able to independently go through each of the steps and be able to successfully um, uh, uh, go through those each month, those periods. And so how do we start? We have to start early. And I think I will be the first to tell you, I was surprised even for my own daughter, that we needed to start at nine. You know, we, we're seeing that uh, menstruation is starting younger for girls. And so it's, remember for girls on the spectrum who have a developmental disorder, they may take longer to learn a skill. So that means maybe starting at eight, we're gonna start explore, exploring. Um, what does it mean to get your period? What does it mean, um, uh, menstruation? So we're gonna talk about terminology. Then we gotta look at the products. I mean, if you take a quick look at the picture there, boy, there's tons of products out there. And we need to look at them. We need to touch them and take them apart and, and really go through those clear and concrete steps of what does it look like and where does it go and all of, all of those 
uh, steps to desensitize. So we're gonna practice wearing pads and practice if we're gonna use tampons. And is it deodorant versus uh, uh, not deodorized? And is it big pads and little pads? And so many options. So we're gonna start early. We're gonna have, use the vocabulary. Now, some of us work with individuals that might be nonverbal. We're gonna use more visual supports with that population. But we know that they're learning receptively. So we wanna give them the words of what are we talking about. And so maybe we're gonna write a social story. You know, we could be looking at a social story on when I get my period. I'm gonna tell a little story out of turn here and I, and I, won't, I won't say who the story is about, but it, it goes to our language. And one of the things that we talk about with puberty and our starting uh, our periods is we talk about the word start. You're gonna start your period. Remember starting? And if you read a book, it might talk about starting your period. Well, there's a young woman that I know and her parents, her mom specifically, went through all the practice of starting your period. They went even to the hospital, the local hospital had getting your daughter ready to start her period. And they, so they went to a little seminar and they got all the products and they practiced and everything was great. And the day came when the girl started her period and she came down at breakfast and announced to mom, I started my period. And the mom, great, this is great. You sure you wanna to go to school today? And she said, yes, I feel comfortable. I'm ready to go to school. Okay, well, finish getting ready and then I'll take you to school. Well, the daughter went upstairs and she didn't come back downstairs. And five minutes goes by and 10 minutes and she still doesn't come back downstairs. And the mom has to go up and knock on the door. Excuse me, honey, are you ready for school? She said, mom, it won't stop. I've started, but it won't stop. Something's wrong. Well, let's, let's now examine, investigate, what language do we use? We talk about starting. But what we don't say is that for five days, the bleeding does not stop. For five days, it will occur. When you're in science class, when you're at recess, when you're, all of those, you are menstruating throughout that whole time period. And in the girl's mind, she was thinking like when you go to the bathroom, you urinate and it stops. You have a bowel movement and it stops. And she was thinking you start, but we didn't train and talk our language about the continuous flow. I tell that story because in so many areas, our language does matter and we need to examine our vocabulary through the eyes of that child, through the eyes of the girl on the spectrum. So it's not just starting, it keeps going. Another resource for you, both as parents and professionals, is a book by Shanna Nichols called Girls Growing Up on the Autism Spectrum. She talks about menstruation in there as well and might give you some more tips on how to work with your daughter in your school, um, preparing for starting. I had to add, add this quote, and I know we have guys and gals all watching, but some of you might appreciate this is from a book called women from another planet and it is a woman on the spectrum and she said i calculated how many periods i would have to struggle in my lifetime for no reason um, she did the numbers for how many children you might even have and how many periods you get so i just thought that was something that we can all maybe relate to so let's move on to the uh, the third area that we're going to cover um, and that is empowering girls, girl power. You know, my start of my talk was about Amanda LaMunion and her artwork and her painting. That was an area that she could shine through her artwork. Um, what we see for all girls and women on the spectrum, there are areas of strength. Rudy Simone, she talks about in her book on Asper Girls, on her strength. So I wanna talk about self-determination and are we building on strengths for our girls? Are we looking for areas where they can demonstrate those uh, important skills of self-advocacy? We talk a little bit about safety as well in girls. I wanna mention uh, another book and, and what's nice, what's happened in the last five years is there have been more resources available on girls and women on the spectrum. This one is called Asperger's and Girls, although I think it would be appropriate for any um, 
any family that has a child has a girl on the spectrum any on the spectrum as well as school professionals build your library so that you have these resources for parents so your library at school is going to have the book by Shannon Nichols maybe a book by Rudy Simone maybe the book Danielle and I wrote but we want to create awareness through education and some of our families do better if they can read on their own and then come back with questions so Asperger's and girls um, Tony Atwood contributes um, of, of course uh, Temple Grandin has a, has a part in there as well but how are we building on strengths Temple Grandin is an example right I mean of course you can't go anywhere in the world and talk about ASD without hearing about Temple Grandin and how as a teenager her family supported her strengths, her interest in working with animals, her interest in architect design and designing things like the squeeze machine. Um, if you've not seen the movie or read anything by Temple Grandin, I encourage you to do so. Now, not all daughters will grow up to be Temple Grandin, but it's important that we start using people like Rudy Simone and Temple Grandin and others as role models that there are strengths, there are areas of interest, whether that's chess club, whether that's their interest in science fiction. Maybe your school will do a girls club for science fiction. You know, it doesn't hurt to ask. Um, if you're the teacher, if you're the speech pathologist at your school, maybe you can sponsor a girl's music group. And it may be nothing more than listening to music and dancing, but if we can get our girls together, maybe do that Mean Stinks program as well on bullying and social relationships, we've got a really great opportunity to build on strength. So is it music? Is it art? academic areas of course but we want to look at other areas of special interest is it animals can we do some kind of an animal club at school and when I use the word club it can be it can be very relaxed it may be just a opportunity for peers to socialize but let's look at some of those strengths um, so that we can teach our girls self-advocacy skills do they know about their disability and if they do, can they identify with other women on the spectrum? So that girl power, that self-determination allows them to have that quality of life that I've mentioned, to be able to work at their level of independence, live at their level of independence, and have meaningful social relationships. So um, looking what opportunities in the school day are we building on strengths? Of course, there's areas that we're teaching to deficits, our IEP goals and objectives. But if I look at a child's schedule, and this is really for any child in school, somewhere in their day should be an opportunity to build on strengths. They get to be the superstar. It's a topic that they do well on. Again, music or art, chess or animals, ballroom dancing there is something to build upon. So I want us to really look at discussing um, those strengths. I love this, I came across, this was a woman who presented at a, at a national conference. Um, they sat down and they just did a little PowerPoint of things that, what does she do well? Activities that she likes, likes to go to church and she likes Special Olympics, you know. Um, this, is, this is something we would do for any child as we explore into transition and self-determination. But we need to do it more so in girls and women because of this gender disparity and the underdiagnosing. So here we see um, this, this maybe with their, her team, educational team, putting together those interests. Uh, roller skating, soccer, cheer. And now I want to say in her school day, where does she get to exhibit and be the superstar during that time? Is it in the morning, the afternoon, for a few minutes? Is she with other girls? I know we can find other girls that would have similar, uh, similar interests. And now we're creating those uh, gender-specific peer mentor groups. So other Aspie women, and I use that uh, terminology because that's what um, Rudy Simone she actually has a website you can go to about Aspie women. But are we helping our girls find mentors in the community? And I understand, you know, if you live someplace, maybe a rural community, maybe you're not familiar with other women, um, Aspie women, 
but there has to be organizations for women, on this, uh, women with disabilities. So looking at um, your peer buddies or your Special Olympics or other community networks that support women with disabilities. Maybe it's at your university. But we need to reach out and make those connections for our girls, help build on those connections. Uh, and it may be through YouTube. You know, I, I think that's, I remember Madison, when she was first learning about her own disability and, and really exploring what it meant to be an Aspie woman, she did look at and, and, and was um, interested in hearing more about stories from women on the spectrum like Temple Grandin and uh, Rudy Simone. I've mentioned creating social groups around women's. There is a women's network online, not, not much. I've seen a little bit on Facebook, on some social media. Of course, cautionary tales there in terms of how to use the internet, and, and that's a whole issue in terms of cyberbullying. We want to make sure we have safe, um, safe places for our girls to be um, on the internet and social media. But this might be a website that might provide some um, insight into what does it mean to be an Aspie woman, as uh, Rudy Simone talks about. Another woman on the spectrum that I just highly respect, and that is uh, Leanne Holiday Willie. Uh, going back to our book on girls under the umbrella of ASD, she wrote the foreword. You know, she's a woman um, who wrote um, Pretending to be Normal. You might be familiar with that book, Pretending to be Normal. And the whole premise of that first book was that she was able to mimic other women. She was able to mask her symptoms of ASD and so was not diagnosed until adulthood. And so um, you might be interested in that book, Pretending to be Normal by Leanne Holiday Willie. But her more recent book, when we talk about as our girls are growing up and that self-advocacy and self-determination, employment and living independently, we've got to talk about safety. And she tells a lot of very uh, insightful and personal stories of things that happened to her um, when she was out in the world and, and being very naive in terms of dating um, being very naive in terms of uh, even other girls taking advantage of her. So safety skills for Asperger women, I encourage if, if you have a teenager, if you have a child who's just starting to explore social relationships outside of school, we need to start talking about safety issues and women. Sexual harassment is, is much higher. 83% uh, in one study of girls with developmental disabilities said they were sexually harassed or sexually abused. And Leanne Holiday Willie tells of those tales that she went through. So women in safety, um, one of the national organization that does a lot of training in this area for school personnel and parent organizations is Autism Risk Management. You can go to their website. Um, but we need to accept early on that our girls are going to be outside of our uh, observation, outside of our um, supervision. And I'm a mom who has a 22-year-old daughter who lives on a university campus. These are, these are issues that address, that affect many of us. Um, and so I can't imagine for some of my families that I work with and Danielle, thinking about Madison, who's taking the bus now to work, who's going on college campuses. Um, these are issues that we must address, we must talk about early on. Um, have uh, safety plans in place so Madison knows I can text, who do I text, what can I say, even if I'm not able to tell Danielle I, I'm um, having, a tr having difficulty, what's a safety word that I can text my mom and she'll come and get me. Just having those safety plans written out Role playing, uh, being clear again on our language. What does it mean? What is sexual harassment? And so Leanne does an excellent job in addressing this very touchy subject. Um, here's another woman, uh, Jennifer uh, McElwee Myers, who's written in the book Asperger's and Girls on Sexuality. Um, and, and what she is saying is to be honest, and I think that's been my message as well. I know these are touchy subjects for school personnel often to talk about 
but we are teachers. And so we must address these issues in a very technical way in terms of breaking down the skills, using direct language, clear and concrete, and sharing this information repeatedly with feedback, right? So it's, it's we want to role play, we want to give feedback, we want to make sure we, we look at those performance outcomes and make sure that we're uh, following up uh, throughout that girl and woman's development. So the future is bright. Uh, girls rule. Dan Danielle and Madison love that. Uh, that's kind of their message in terms of outcomes um, and whether that outcome is more supported employment or if it's independent employment. Is it uh, supported living arrangements or is it living independently? Is it having one friend or many friends? There's a continuum for all of us in terms of quality of life and how we would look at those uh, main areas of quality of life. But we can do things early on with our girls. Volunteering opportunities is one way to build on strengths. I know for Madison, um, she was involved um, with local charities early on, and that allows her to build self-esteem and self-worth goes on to build skills as she moves into adulthood. So I encourage all my teachers and parents out there, again, to identify those strengths and mentoring programs that might be available in your uh, community. Again, another little quote, girls and women with ASD, if they are empowered, if we teach these, school, these skills, the social skills that I'm talking about early on, the appropriate uh, self-determination skills, higher rates of employment, higher rates of even earnings after graduation. So we know that the research, that it pans out when we do our work early on. And I want to end with a quote here from a woman that I was able to interview for um, my book on girls, um, Ashley. You know, she, this is a, a, was a young woman who struggled, you know, not sure if that diagnosis, did it fit her? Uh, wasn't sure if she was able to um, under, really come to grips and understand what it meant to be an Aspie woman, uh, to use um, Rudy Simone's terminology. And now she finally says that she doesn't see it as a disorder, but she sees it as a gift. For her, it's brought her more strengths. She's had to overcome hurdles, but she understands that's the journey for any woman or girl um, uh, for in, in any area. And so for her, it just might be slightly different. So I, I appreciate her words of wisdom, and I hope that I've been able to share with you some specific strategies in the area of social communication, the puberty, uh, menstruation, and then also as our girls and women grow up and are empowered uh, to look at that the future is bright. Again, I'm Dr. Lori Ernstberger, and any follow-up questions can be at drlori at cox.net. Thank you very much.